We are in beautiful Boulder, Colorado, right outside Black Cat Bistro, owned by Chef Eric and Jill Skoken, who are welcoming some of the best chefs from around the world for the James Beard Foundation Celebrity Chef Tour. They're gonna be cooking right in here for 150 people. There's a master mixologist, tons of food and drink. I'm excited, I hope you are too. Let's check it out. What a day. Yeah? Yeah. We have uh, 10 chefs from around the country who graciously have put their restaurant lives on hold, flown out or driven out to cook this incredible dinner with us. I'm, I'm blown away. So second time you're hosting this, that's pretty amazing. There's a lot of moving parts. It's really hard to marshal everything together for a dinner like this, you know, but ultimately so much fun. So I'm pretty fortunate to be able to get the world to come into me, you know, look over their shoulders and see and learn and grow as a person and as a chef. It's just, you know, yeah, I'm tickled. So how many people are gonna be eating tonight? 150. 150. 300% increase uh, in what we normally do, right? Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? Nothing. Sitting here with Jeff Black, the director of the James Beard Foundation Celebrity Chef Tour. Uh, Jeff, what do we have in store for today? Well, today's the day. We were out on the farm yesterday. The chefs were picking vegetables and checking out the livestock. And today we are setting up for the Celebrity Chef Tour dinner. So at six o'clock, guests will start arriving here on 13th Street, and we'll have 150 guests out here on the street enjoying a six-course dinner prepared from chefs all over the country. So how long has the chef tour been around? It's been around since 2004. We started it to take the Beard House on tour. Um, the Beard House is in New York. Chefs from all over the world cook at the Beard House three to five nights a week. It's James Beard's old house. He died in 1985 and Julia Child and a number of other chefs got together and started the James Beard Foundation. Chefs are invited to cook at the house. They travel to New York, cook in his house. People eat in the bedrooms, in the dining room, in the sitting room, uh, in his library, and it is literally a house and the kitchen is not much bigger than it was in 1934 when he moved in. How involved is James Beard with kind of the farm to table movement? Oh, huge. huge. Sustainability Huge, movement. yeah. Um, he was, before he died, he was a big push of that. Because in the 50s and 60s, when the whole movement of fast food came about, he was one to say, hey, let's, let's not go to these giant corporate farms. Let's keep, keep the food local. Let's make sure that it can travel unrefrigerated from a truck to the restaurant. He was very against the processed foods. What's the future for the Chef Tour? The future is, is keep on going. We have a new CEO at the James Beard Foundation and she is making some of the greatest changes just to get our name out there as the leader in the industry of telling people about food being the, the taste makers when we come into a town. What we want to tell people is come enjoy the meal, enjoy the meals that these chefs put together. They're a, an amazing deal for what you get. And the other thing is join the foundation. You can join anywhere from, I think it's a $35 a year membership all the way up to whatever you want to donate. Any, and, anybody and anybody can join. Oh, I did not know that. And, yeah, I did not and know that's that. I what's just, yes. so great. No, okay. anybody can join the foundation and be a whole part of this food movement and get the emails and, you know, learn what's happening in the food industry. And we send out a lot of emails to tell people about what chefs are doing and what's happening with sustainability and the catch program so that, you know, we're not depleting our oceans of fish that we need to survive on. So. Yeah, so jamesbeard.org. Our restaurant's called uh, Cloverdale Farm and Restaurant. So we have a small farm outside of Steamboat Springs where we try to source as much as possible for our restaurant. Uh, the restaurant itself is a, a fine dining, tasting menu restaurant. So we uh, 
We offer an 11 to 13 course tasting menu. Um, it kind of fluctuates in the amount of courses depending on what time of the year it is. Inspired from the farm, as much as of the produce as we can use, as much from the local farmers, um, ranchers around Steamboat that we can use, we uh, try to utilize. You know, if we had overflow of something, there's a thing called the Community Agriculture Alliance in Steamboat where they kind of have like an online farmer's market. Oh, okay. So you can put whatever you have on there. Anybody can do it in the whole community, so it's pretty cool. That's, that is thing. Cool. You put it on there, people go online, order it, and they come and pick it up from the from the Ag Alliance office. So it's Almost like a CSA then? Yeah, I mean, it pretty oh, much it is. Anybody can put it on there, whatever they have, if it's honey or cool. eggs or meat or produce. A hundred year old house that you guys have? Yeah, it's exactly a hundred year old, years old this year. Um, so it was built in 1918. How far is the restaurant from the farm? That's less than 10 minutes. 10 probably minutes. five miles, yeah. Everything we've tried to do from the farm aspect of our business has been to kind of show what can be done in a high rocky climate. So if we can develop an agriculture center that educates people from you know other communities um, of how to do this sustainably and effectively and efficiently. Where do you get your flavors from or what are the big influences on your flavors and your cooking style? A lot of times it's from necessity, I guess. Like, you know, having a farm, you're getting the things that are coming to your restaurant beyond your choice necessarily, you know what I mean? So whenever things are, are ripe or they're ready to be harvested, that's what's coming in. So a lot of times our flavor combinations are coming from that. Regardless of if it normally goes together, out of necessity we kind of figure out ways to put them together. Yep, my parents uh, grew up uh, still on the farm um, in Sparta, Wisconsin, so just a little bit of northwest of Milwaukee. It's been in our family since the 30s, I believe my grandfather got it. Was dairy for a long time, we've always done crops on it, and my father switched over to beef in the 70s. Obviously, we're pretty self-sustained growing up on the farm and growing our own products and then canning and processing and dealing with the winter and processing animals along with it. You know, we grew up that kind of lifestyle, so it was always cooking for the most part within our household and just kind of something we fell into right out of high school. We just kind of stayed with it and went into restaurants and it was familiar and pretty soon became fun and 20 some years later, still doing it, yeah. And so Arden was your, your first one? First one, yep. Arden will be five years, uh, the end of October. How did ramen come about? Ramen came about um, through my time, you know, working for people in the kitchens that worked for a Japanese gentleman for a couple of years. And we took a trip to Tokyo, started getting into the Japanese culture and a lot of the, their ways of lives and a lot of the dishes that they would traditionally do and fell into love with ramen and it, it stuck, it stuck, you know. We, 13 years later after I started making the ramen, uh, we finally opened up the ramen shop. When we first opened Arden, Friday and Saturday nights, we would close Arden, turn around and turn into a ramen shop from 11.30 at night till one in the morning. Every Friday and Saturday for like two years, it was great. So to do that as a more on the fun kind of after hour pop-up was a good structure of starting it before we actually went into brick and mortar. Right. A huge part of who we are is, um, you know, sustainable seafood sourcing. Um, we're really mindful of um, where we procure our seafood and just trying to keep things fresh. We are a restaurant partner with Monterey Bay Aquarium. I'm part of their Blue Ribbon Task Force, which is just a group of chefs from around the nation that work together to get that sustainability word out and educate people on that. And we're also part of the James Beard Smart Catch program as well. So does that take you around the country? Or? Yeah, we, uh, we have conferences sometimes twice a year in different cities. Uh, last fall we were in South Carolina at the South Carolina Aquarium. We're going to Portland this fall and then it creates a network of chefs so doing things like this has been a great opportunity. What do you love about Jax? Man, so many things. Hard to put my finger on it. Um, I think you know, it started with a workplace that just had an unbelievable culture. I really latched on to people around us that were talking about food, really there to be, this is what they wanted to do, this was their profession, it wasn't um, just punching a time clock. And you've been a part of the team to help open uh, other Jack's restaurants. Yeah. And I think the newer one was in Kansas? Uh -huh. Yeah, we have, uh, our Kansas City Jack's is just about to turn five, actually. Is 
this your first uh, James Beard Foundation chef tour? Or? No, actually, um, we've done a couple in Seattle, and um, I was down and did one in LA. Okay. So I think this is the fourth, fourth one that I've done. I'm a farmer, a chef, winemaker. I have a farm in Redmond, and um, our winery is in Ballard. It's a small garage east called Piggyback Cellars. And I'm currently at South Seattle College as the dean for the culinary program, the wine program, and the horticulture program. How's that? So it's great. It's a, it's a different twist in life, you know, from being a chef and being in the kitchen 24-7 for 20-some-odd years and then stepping away and being able to focus on the farm and the winery and also still be involved with cooking and chefs. South Seattle College offers a lot to young students that couldn't afford to go to school other places. So it's nice to be able to share my knowledge at this point in life. When I started farming, I said it changed the way I looked at food. You know, being in Seattle, we have a very short growing season. And over the 19 years, being a farmer and a chef, learning how to connect that circle. How do you stay seasonal? How do you have items on your menu that are local? And how do you say in the middle of winter when someone says what's from the farm, stand there and tell them 95% of the stuff on the menu. And they can say, how is that? So we would freeze, um, we'd dry, we'd can, process, we'd make jams, jellies, chutneys. We had a root cellar, so we'd winter things over in the root cellar. I work with a cannery. All our pickles and relishes and jams and jellies were all processed at a cannery. So we would have the winter pantry, I would call it. Oh, right. So um, that we had you know, abundance in the winter time. And we would get right until spring and then everything would start to grow again. And So what's your background? I was a Chili's to go girl when I was 16 and kind of just fell in love with kitchens right then and there. So worked in a lot of kitchens and went to the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park. Worked at the Spotted Pig in the city and then burned out a little bit and farmed and now I have my own place. What were the challenges of opening up your own place? Oh, how many hats you have to wear. Um, it's not just about cooking. It's construction, it's getting permits, it's getting the money, it's the staff. I think that was the most surprising and challenging part to me. You just think you're gonna go and cook and that's not, that's not all of it right. at all. What's your inspiration or influences for the style of cooking that you have or for Annette? Yeah, so I think it's definitely a combination, um, but I worked at the Spotted Pig when I was pretty young. April had an Italian, um, British flair, so that's a lot of the inspiration. Um, and then just doing simple food really, really well. And that's kind of the, we have a wood-fired grill and we have some stoves and that's it. What's the future for you and, and Annette? Are you, you going to you hunker down for now? Or I'm hunkered any... down. Cool. I'm not doing anything else. <laughs> this is it. It's my baby. You know, I've always said if we do something else, then I'd probably close this chapter and start something new. But um, the way we kind of have our restaurant set up is this is my second Saturday night away in a year and a half. And so it's a small crew, and I, and I like being there. Um, I like cooking every night. So Favorite thing to cook? Oy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I am obsessed with vegetables um, on the grill. Shellfish. Okay. I just love it. I really enjoy wintertime and braising and um, hearty flavors and when things marinate and the sauces can sort of build those layers. It's always been my favorite thing to cook fish. I've worked in Seattle for most of my career. Um, so I was obviously surrounded by fish and seafood and all the freshest uh, everything from the ocean. Favorite thing to eat at the moment? Always shitty takeout Chinese food. <laughs> I can't say pizza, huh? No. Yeah, you can say pizza. <laughs> Bitter greens, something that has a little bit of a bite to it. Cajun food, it's probably my favorite thing. It's nostalgic if I can have gumbo or red beans and rice or, or jambalaya is probably my favorite. My favorite food is today's food. I love going to the market and using the things that I see there as the inspiration. That's a little tiny step that everyone at home can do, right? Become inspired by the vegetables, right? And then open up the index of the cookbook. Right. Oh, leeks. Oh, that that sounds great, right? right? And then, right? And then away yeah. you go, right? That way you can let the 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 food of the moment, the thing that's really perfect. You can let that determine 
what's going to be on the dinner table tonight. What are you going to be cooking tonight? So we are doing two small canapes. The first one is an uni toast. I made a, a sea urchin uni uh, mousse that'll be spread on brioche with pickled shrimp and a little bit of cucamelons, which are little gherkins. So tonight I actually brought uh, beef from our farm, from Wisconsin. And so it's gonna be just lightly grilled beef. And then to go along with it, we're going to have some fried broccoli, dust in a little bit of Indian lime pickle, onion ash, and then we're gonna grade some banded cheddar from Wisconsin over the top of it. I'm doing lamb carpaccio. Lamb is just shaved, very thin. We have from the farm, Eric's farm, heirloom cherry tomatoes that are charred a little bit with a torch so they have a little bit of a smoked flavor to them. I'm gonna put a little bit of sea salt, a little mint, olive oil. We have a touch of goat cheese and a crostini. With the farm to table, it seems like it's a movement. Do you think it's a fad or do you think it's the way of the future? Uh, do you think more and more people are gonna be doing it? I think more and more people are gonna be doing it and more and more people have to be doing it. I think there's, um, it's too important to just be a fad. I hope it's not a fad. You know, I think unfortunately maybe it started out more as a, a wonderful marketing tool Right. maybe than the reality of what it takes and I think now that people are getting into it more they are finding out that it is it's a lot more involved instead of going to the grocery store or right. calling your veg guy and he just drops it off or yeah. you know ordering it on Amazon or getting a FedEx to you it's it's a little different when you have to start working with nature and and yeah. working in that kind of mindset but then once you get into that mindset then it becomes normal. More and more chefs are becoming aware of where their food is coming from they're looking at not only carbon footprint, but they're looking at where's it grown? How long does it take to get to my restaurant? I've been a chef for 40 some odd years. I've been farming for 19 years. There were chefs doing it back then. There are chefs, young chefs, that are still involved in the movement and taking it to a different level. I feel like if a lot of people claim that they are farm to table, then it really takes away from those places that are busting to make it happen. But I do hope that people start to recognize where food's coming from, what it takes to get it, and with climate change and things changing, seasons are changing, I think that we need to stay in line with what's available instead of carting things, you know, from Mexico right. in the dead of winter. So I hope it's the future. What challenges do you run into doing the farm to table in the High Rockies? Uh, especially with the winter times. Right, there's challenges, but you know, we've, we've kind of been figuring out how to go around them. So we have a very short growing season, um, but what we've been able to do is kind of at the end of the growing season, we harvest everything. And then even through the summer, we harvest as much as we can and preserve. So we pickle, um, ferment, dry, uh, anything like that. And then we also have a root cellar at the restaurant so we can store as many of the root vegetables as possible, um, put them down there. We use the moist sand techniques. So we bury them in moist sand. They hold their energy and then we use them throughout the winter. Obviously you're working with nature and seasons and you know, weather-wise and anything that happens and trying to do that in a timely fashion, knowing your quantities, knowing what's coming in, your seasonality on this might only last for three weeks. You know, especially in the Midwest, we our growing season is a lot shorter than a lot of the other places in the country. So, you know, we need to make the most out of the four months or so that we're going to have product-wise. During the winter, I definitely I have a hard time saying we're farm to table just because it's Colorado and, you know, there are a few restaurants out there doing it and just serving root vegetable. And I think also getting people to understand that they, you have to pay more for farm to table food. You're paying the farmer more and, and it has to translate to the diner as well. So that's, I think, a huge challenge. If someone wanted to follow in your footsteps, yeah. being a restaurateur, a chef, what advice would you give them? Put your head down and work. You know, I think there's a lot of young chefs that are looking to open a restaurant from the get-go and there's so much to learn in between. If you're gonna develop a farm, I would really talk to people. There's such great agriculture communities everywhere you go. Like I know here in Boulder, I know in Steamboat, like the agriculture community is so tight and they're just like always willing to offer advice. Learn every day from everyone you come in contact with. Work hard, keep smiling, um, and, and have fun. Whatever it is you're doing, do it really well and you'll be successful. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. So, thank you. It. My word of advice is take the first step.
Thank you for joining us for the first season of this adventure. During the course of this season, we've identified many issues we are facing that are a direct result of our current food production methods, and we've met forward-thinking people who are doing their best to find solutions to these problems. If you've missed any of our episodes, you can find them right now on the Forking Truth YouTube channel, and please visit our Facebook page and Instagram. Thanks to all the people for their love and support, and thank you to everyone making it a tastier, healthier, more environmentally friendly tomorrow. It's not going to change overnight, but together we can get there. Until next time.